Um, we will, um, I think I actually covered everything you need to do the lobster simulation. Um, just fine today, it's gonna be talking about um, how electron energy levels work and how those, um, you make those rainbow um, barcodes based on what wavelengths of light are either um, are emitted and there if it's emitting light and that means that you've got a bunch of high energy electrons giving away energy as light to settle down to remember that term relax um, but the opposite is if you shine light on a particular substance it will only absorb light in the wavelengths that it can absorb and so you wind up with um let me go back to um the slides real quick so if you if you heat up or if you give energy to a certain atom you get a some a um, light that's emitted specifically in certain wavelengths but on the flip side if you shine light on strontium it'll absorb these wavelengths and so the absorption spectrum so this is what's called the emission spectrum meaning it's what kind of light is emitted or given off the absorption spectrum looks like a rainbow it's the exact inverse it's a rainbow that's missing specific black spots and those black spots correspond to these same um, wavelengths of light. The same wavelengths of light that it gives off when it's heated up are the wavelengths of light that it will absorb when you shine light on it. Right, so um, the Labster simulation has um, a few of these where it basically is going to have you sort of mix and match elements to sort to see what um type of metals might be present in a star by looking at what kind of light it gives off but you're looking at an absorption spectrum in this case which is why it looks like a full rainbow missing black spots but the logic is the exact same as um as the other example where we um we're heating it up to give off specific specific wavelengths of light okay, it's the difference between if you're looking at what's absorbed, that's the wavelengths of light that can it can absorb to promote an electron up to an energy level. And the um, the emission spectrum is the wavelengths of light that it gives off when those electrons fall back down or relax. Right, so they're always going to be the same wavelengths. It's sort of like Q when we're talking about um, heat being absorbed or released. If light is absorbed, you're going to have a rainbow that's missing spots because that's what the what the element is absorbing. If it's something that if it's giving off light, it's going to be electrons relaxing, and it's going to be the exact inverse. Sean, when you say light in this instance, is it actual light or is it energy? Is it the wavelength of light or is it an energy that you turns out that those that those are kind of interchangeable light is actually the way that energy is transmitted from one place to another if you don't have things that are in direct contact with each other if things are in direct contact with each other then something hot can just rub against something cold and you wind up transmitting energy that way thermal energy but if you have something that's isolated and it needs to give away energy, it can't give away energy to nothing if it's not touching anything. So it creates light basically as a way to move energy from one place to another. Um, so when we talk about light, we a lot of times we will talk about it in the context of high energy light or low energy light um, or having a specific wavelength. Those, those are all sort of linked and it's it's beyond this class a little bit as to um exactly what the you know how mathematically they're linked if you take gen chem we'll go over it in more detail uh, and if you take physics we'll go over it in a lot of detail um well not not we i won't be there um but kathy or bruce will talk about it in a lot of detail um 
but they're they wind up being related terms light and energy are almost interchangeable um so it's kind of cool in some ways your eyes are actually a way of observing how much energy something else has because the color of light that your eyes see is related to the wavelength of light that's being given off which is related to the energy that's being either absorbed or reflected so the same way that your nose and your taste buds are your body's way of looking at the molecular shape of certain compounds to determine what tastes good or what's poisonous your light is your body's way of interpreting how much energy photons have. Um, the other thing that I wanted to go over that that's relevant for the homework specifically, so that's all you need to get the lab done. And we will go over this next section in more detail in um, lecture on Monday, but there's one con, or sorry, on Tuesday, whatever day I see you next for lecture Wednesday. Um, but I wanted you guys to see it at least once so that um, some of the homework problems will make more sense. And that's the idea of um, atomic mass. So we talked about mass number as being how many protons plus neutrons you have. And we basically said it's always an integer and it's just a way to count how many protons plus neutrons you have. Um, we can actually put units to that mass, though, that allow us to actually calculate some things. And that's actually what we see with these, um, with the mass numbers on the periodic table, are actually represent a mixture of the different compounds or the different isotopes that we see in nature on Earth. So these numbers are actually would be different in, in a different solar system or even on a different planet, um, because they represent sort of the average. If you picked 100 carbon atoms at random and you weighed them, the average mass would be 12.011. Um, 12.011 in the units we actually use, um, if we're talking about individual atoms, are, um, I guess I was not screen sharing, let me go back. So the numbers that are on our periodic table above the atomic number, these are the mass number, and this sort of the, the average um based on what isotopes are common in nature right so that's why a lot of a lot of them are close to a, an integer number but they're not an exact integer number and some of them are not all that close if you look at chlorine chlorine's got a mass number of 35.457 which means it's really it's got a mixture of different isotopes on earth in nature if you just picked a bunch of chlorine atoms um, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to get a mixture of different isotopes. So what these numbers really do is they allow us to actually start talking about masses that we could measure by putting stuff on a scale. Um, and they allow us, but the thing is the atoms are so small that these masses, we don't talk about individual atoms. So if we said that carbon is 12.011, um, AMU, that means that on average, if we picked 100, uh, 100 for, um, carbon atoms and we weighed them, the average weight would be 12.011 atomic mass units, or AMU. And that that unit is not really all that useful because we don't actually ever weigh things as an individual atom. AMU is not all that helpful as far as things we could actually measure. So we actually have a, a um, really, really simple conversion. They basically picked a conversion very, very carefully to say what an AMU was. Um, and basically, it allows us to say that one AMU is equal to one gram per mole. And that, so gram per mole. And a mole in this case is, is basically just a, a way of counting atoms. So because we can't count individual atoms, we never can actually measure the mass of an individual atom. What we do is we basically pick an arbitrary number to say, okay, this many atoms is a mole, right? So it's, it's a lot like a dozen, 
it's that that's the most common it's kind of a, a really tired analogy you'll hear it a million different places the mole is the chemist's dozen a mole is just a, a way to group a specific number of objects together like dozen so you could count 12 dozen donuts or 10 dozen donuts and that would just be in every one dozen equals 12 right of whatever you're talking about it could be a dozen donuts it could be a dozen eggs it could be a dozen balloons it could be a dozen blades of grass doesn't matter what you're talking about a dozen means 12 of something right so a mole is defined as 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd objects so a mole of any anything is this number of that object so a mole of eggs would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd eggs right so it's all it is is a way of counting how many objects you have and it's picked that number is picked very very carefully so that it was based it was based around what is um how many atoms are in one gram of hydrogen originally and so that's why hydrogen's atomic mass on the periodic table is really close to one because if you had this many hydrogen atoms it would weigh one gram right so a mole is most of the time we're going to be talking about moles of atoms or moles of a compound moles of oxygen moles of carbon just because we don't actually care about how many atoms of carbon we have, because we can't actually measure how many atoms of carbon we have, but we can measure how many moles of carbon we have, because this is a basically a way to get from being something so tiny we can't see it to something we could measure. All right, so on the anytime we we have an atomic mass that actually is going to be a way that we can convert between a mass of something and how many moles of something we have so for instance if we had um let's say we had the uh, pick a good easy one um Let's say we had 72.0 grams of helium. And we want to know how many helium, how many moles of helium that was. Well, we use the periodic table similar to the, you know, how I was talking about the periodic table has so much information in it. If you look at the periodic table for helium its atomic mass is 4.003 so what that's telling us is that for every 4.003 grams of helium is one mole of helium so the periodic table is full of conversion factors Because if we can say 4.003 grams of helium equals one mole of helium, that is a conversion factor, right? Which means if we want to take grams of helium and convert to moles, just like using a density, we could say, okay, well, we have 72 grams and every 4.003 grams is one mole of helium. And that allows us to go from something we can measure to a number of atoms. Right, so our first, when we plug this in, 72 divided by 4.003, 17.987. So within, so for sig figs, we've got three sig figs here, be 17, 18.0 moles. Of helium. And so 18.0 moles 
and not sorry, not uh, you have to make sure you write M O L. I don't even know why they bothered to abbreviate it by just leaving off one letter, um, but they do M O L and M O L E are the same thing. All right, so this, when we get to talking about how we mix things in specific ratios, like one hydrogen atom or one oxygen atom for every two hydrogen atoms, we're not comparing grams of hydrogen to grams of oxygen, we're comparing specifically the ratio of atoms. So these atomic masses are a way to get to how many moles we have. And then we could look at the ratio, say, of um, two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of oxygen in water. All right, so the atomic mass winds up being one of the most important conversions that we do in chemistry because we don't just want to talk about them in terms of grams. We need to be able to talk about them in terms of how many atoms we have. But we don't have a way of measuring atoms. So this is how we do it. And if we wanted, if we didn't want it in moles, we wanted actual number of helium atoms, we just use our definition of a mole as a conversion. We can say for every one mole of anything is that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms or objects. So once we know how many moles we have, we do this conversion to get to how many atoms we have. And really, this, this week's homework is one of the only times you're ever going to actually have to do this, because almost never do we actually care about how many specific atoms. We're almost always going to leave it in moles once we get the hang of what a mole is. But for now, while we're practicing this, to really cement it in your head, there's a couple of problems on the homework that say, how many hydrogen atoms are we going to have if this is how much mass we have? So we would start by converting into moles of hydrogen and then go from moles of hydrogen to atoms of hydrogen. Gina? Can we just finish this off together? Yeah, so if we wanted, to actually do this. So, so once we set this conversion up, and this is, this is true anytime you want to go from moles of anything to the actual number of objects, it's always the same conversion. And that's, it's on the um, equation sheet in a couple places. It's also called, this number is also called Avogadro's number, um, which is perfect timing for Cinco de Mayo because it, Really, everybody's favorite chemistry joke is to call guacamole avocado's number. Um, it's Avogadro's number is that guy's actual name. Um, but it's always the same number. So it's just anytime you want to go from moles to objects, one mole of something is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So 18 times 6.022, 10 to the 23rd. And you get 1.08 times 10 to the 25. And that our units now on this are going to be helium atoms. All right, because we had 18.0 moles of helium atoms. And every one mole is this Av Avogadro's number. I almost said it. Um, is Avogadro's number of actual atoms. So just like if you, if you have nine dozen cupcakes and you want to know how many cupcakes that is, you, well, nine dozen cupcakes and every one dozen is 12 cupcakes. This is our conversion. It's like 12 of something is one dozen, except it's Avogadro's number is one mole. All right. So, and again, we'll see this in more detail and just, just for fun, um, and I'll probably you'll probably hear me say this again on Wednesday. Um, but uh, if you want an idea for just how big this number is, this is about a trillion trillion. Um, and if you had if you had a mole of ping pong balls, it would cover the surface of the Earth 
in a layer about a mile deep. Um, and if you had a one of my the other answer to my what's your favorite what if question from that blog is what would happen if you had a mole of moles if you took this many moles and had them in one place at the same time. Um, and the answer is it would be something that weighed had about the same mass as the moon, roughly. Um, so in other words, we would have another planet orbiting the Earth made up entirely of moles if we had a mole of moles. So it's a huge number. It's also a pretty good estimate for the total number of grains of sand on the planet Earth. You totaled up every grain of sand on the planet Earth, it would be about this, about a mole of grains of sand. So again, huge number. Um, and this is why we don't count individual atoms for the most part, because they're so small, we can't do anything with that. We can't ever measure that or move individual atoms, but we can do math with a mole of atoms. All right, so none of that's relevant to the lab, to the labster simulation, but this idea of using atomic masses and converting the moles is going to show up in um, at least a few of the homework problems. You now have the tools to do at least half the homework problems. Um, and then we will add um, some periodic trends and um, how we can average out isotopes will be some topics we go over in class on Wednesday. So when you get to those problems, which I think are problem three, and um, there's a couple where it says, rank these by atomic radius. Um, those are the types of problems that we'll get to in class on Wednesday. So don't beat yourself up over trying to figure those out if you're working on the homework between now and then. All right, so questions at this point. I just dumped a whole bunch more skills and math on you. So I expect you will have some questions at some point, but it's fine to either just hang out and ask me when you get to them or use today to just finish the lobster simulation and ask me your questions on Wednesday um, once you've had a chance to look at the homework a little bit more. Um, but we sh I believe you, you have at least a, a good enough um, base to get started on the homework and make it, mo you know, get at least half of the problems done. All right, then I'll stop talking. I see there was something in the chat. Do sig figs matter? Yes, sig figs still matter when we talk about um, atomic mass. And they also still matter for Avogadro's number. If we had more sig figs, we could be more exact here. Um, sig figs don't count if we're talking about like the quiz problem of um, there are 21 neutrons in the nucleus of, car of calcium 41. That was a counting number. So that goes um, to infinite sig figs. It's exact. If you, have, if you know it's calcium 41, then every nucleus has exactly 21 neutrons. So if it's a counting number, or like we wrote a conversion that says every water molecule has two hydrogen atoms. It's not about two hydrogen atoms. It's exactly two hydrogen atoms because you can't have a part of an atom. So if it's a conversion like that, then those are exact conversions. But if we're talking about atomic mass, this is four sig figs, the way it's written on the periodic table. And so picking your periodic table means that sometimes you'll get more or less sig figs, depending on how detailed of a periodic table you have. Um, but good job still paying attention to that. Um, And at the end here, started with three sig figs. This conversion was four sig figs. This conversion was four sig figs. So our final answer is limited by the sig figs we started with. Three sig figs here, three sig figs there, three sig figs here. All right, because every other approximate conversion we used was more sig figs than that. So this is what's limiting how many sig figs we get at the end. All right, any other questions on, on these type of calculations at this point? Um, I have a question kind of back from the 
the uh, lecture. I was in and out of service for a moment. And Miss, what was it? What is the terminology used for that? The one S or two S two P. What is that called? That's a Just good a question. Symbol? So, so that uh, collectively is called the electron configuration. Electron configuration. So the whole thing, the electron, the if we said the electron configuration of oxygen, it's the whole thing, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Okay. And if you look at the individual pieces of each of these, those are what are called the quantum numbers, actually, which I think this lab might actually get into. So this was actually a very relevant question and something I meant to mention. Um, this first number, that we just kept referring to is the energy level. Um, mathematically, we see it written as N, and it just it's also called the principal quantum number. Or just energy level. Those are all sort of interchangeably used. And so that's what this first number is describing here in front of these. The S or the P is telling you the type of, it's called an orbital, is the sort of the shape of the wave that you get from these. And so an S orbital has a different shape than a P orbital. The, the, right. They really are just a different mathematical function to show what the wave looks like. And is that like, I mean, just to kind of conceptualize it in my mind. So if you have orbitals around the nucleus, is that like levels of, of depth into the atom or just random? I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That's... That's a really good question. That's one of the things that's really tricky about quantum is it's you can think of it like it's a three dimensional function. If you've taken um, uh, college algebra, you probably talked about how you graph things in 3D, right? You have an mm -hmm. X and a Y and a Z to represent right. all three dimensions. These orbitals and the orbital shapes are basically functions in three dimensions that have a specific shape to them. So the S orbitals look kind of like a sphere. Okay. And that's that sphere really represents the volume of space where you're likely to find an electron because these electrons kind of exist as a probability. They're somewhere in that shape. Okay. And P orbitals look like a more complicated shape. They look kind of like if you took two balloons. Yeah, they look like figure eight. Or if you took two balloons and you held them together by the knot at the middle, uh -huh. they would not naturally have sort of that it balloon look shape shape pointing up and then another one pointing down um and so but that really it's there it's really saying that okay for these p electrons you're likely to find an electron in this overall region mm -hmm. um you're not like the electron is not likely to be outside of this area there's a possibility that it is because they don't never exist in any one place for um, and that's part of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is the idea that you can never know exactly where an electron is and how fast it's moving at the same time. Wow. Um, which when you get down to it, it actually kind of does make sense, but it makes it really hard to visualize how these electrons behave because the act of observing them, we observe things by bouncing light off of them and then our light goes into our eyes or into a detector. That tells us where something is, right? If, I, if you ask where a baseball is, you don't have any photons bouncing off of it. You don't know where it is, right? If you're in the dark and I say, where's the baseball? You don't know. But if you turn your light on, then you can measure where it is by bouncing light off of it. And the problem is when you get to something as small as an electron, bouncing light off of it moves it. It's right. the equivalent and of trying to figure out where a baseball is by throwing golf balls at it. If you actually hit it, you might be able to tell where it was, but not, not, not where it is now. And can electrons ever bang into each other or are they ever in the same yeah, field? Yeah, they, they do. They, they're kind of in these same shapes. And, and when you have electrons in this 1s orbital, so if we look at the 1s orbital, 
it's basically the shape of a sphere and it can hold two electrons and these two electrons have opposite with what we call spin it's mm -hmm. sort of like if you have a basketball you could spin it in one direction or you could spin you could spin it clockwise or counterclockwise and give it the same amount of energy like a planet just be, in orbit yeah like a planet in orbit you can have a planet that's orbiting with the exact same speed and energy but in the opposite direction mm -hmm. And so all of these electrons, you can have a spin up electron or a spin down electron, and they basically don't interact with each other. They mm -hmm. kind of can be in the same place at the same time. So another, I use a ton of analogies in quantum because everything's so weird. Um, it's a little bit like if you had a roommate that worked the exact opposite work schedule as you. Mm -hmm. You could both be living in the same bedroom and never see each other other than on probably on uh, in terms of probability odds are you would never see each other you might bump into each other from time to time but you could be in the same place without interacting with each other because you have opposite spin mm -hmm. um so within this sphere these two electrons can both be in there at the same time and they might bump into each other like you might run into your roommate but for the most part, they're on opposite sides of the sphere of this sphere at any given time. And, and really happens. they're both in everywhere at the same time. Oh. Because they don't exist as one object. They kind of are, it's like if you if I know you have a cat, right? When you're not at home and I ask you where your cat is, well, you know it's within your house. Mm -hmm. But you don't know specifically, is the cat on the bed? Is the cat in the kitchen? right? The cat's somewhere inside the house. Right. And that's kind of like the way these orbitals work. We know somewhere within this shape is where these electrons are. But until we actually see them, they're kind of, we have to treat them like they're everywhere e equally. Interesting. It's very odd. Um, yeah. And, and it, we will continue to do some conceptual stuff. There's not a lot mathematically I can test you on on this. So it's basically, if you can, you look at the periodic table and write electron configurations, and maybe a couple of brief explain generally how how this works, sort of questions. Um, so don't get too worried if you are not like, how are we going to use any of this? Well, we're not really at this level. Mm. I'm preparing you for the next step, which is this is how it applies to the periodic table. Awesome. Sure. No. All right. Any other questions on on anything we've gone over? I really love talking about quantum stuff, so I don't mind at all if you wanted to more clarification or save them for class on Wednesday if you want. All right, then um, let's actually so to give this a chance this recording.